Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Stefan van Erp. I'm the Professor of Fundamental Theology here at this faculty, um, and it is just my task uh, to welcome you all uh, on behalf of the Leuven Newman Society and this faculty. Uh, we feel very honored uh, to have as a guest here tonight Professor William Kavanaugh of uh, DePaul University from the United States. Uh, Professor Kavanaugh's work has been very helpful in the last few years for our research in uh, political theology. And we're very grateful uh, that he was willing to accept our inv invitation to um, give a lecture for you all tonight. Um, Michael Barnes from the Leuven Newman Society will introduce Professor uh, Kavanaugh to you. Uh, I wish you all a good evening. There will be time for some questions after the lecture, uh, so please listen very carefully and prepare your questions well, uh, and then I hope, hopefully I'll speak to you after. Um, enjoy. Mika. Dear professors, dear colleagues, dear students, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Leuven Newman Society, it is my great pleasure to introduce tonight's topic and speaker and to thank, first of all, Professor Van Erp and his research group on political theology for co-organizing today's events with Professor Kavanaugh. The Leuven Newman Society encourages the academic community to engage with the Catholic faith, and we are very happy to cooperate with existing research activities like the one by Professor Van Erp. We are pursuing Blessed Newman's ideal of clear heads and holy hearts, mainly through our uh, Fides et Ratio lecture series, of which tonight's lecture is the final one of this academic year. You can stay in touch with us and other upcoming events through our website, newsletter, Facebook page, and even to the very uh, old-fashioned way of, well, talking to us. Or uh, Father Aaron is sitting there and uh, Jacob is our, is our president, so feel free to, to come and talk to us. In January 2016, plans were revealed to add a preamble to the constitution of this country to specify that the law of the state is above any religious law. Here, O Belgium, the constitution, your Leviathan, is one, and thou shalt have no other laws before me, for I am a jealous constitution. The proposed amendment literally advocates a separation between faith and state, geloof and staat, based on a literally deep faith, deep geloof in human rights and our fundamental freedoms. If we expand our historical or geographical scope a little bit, the relationship between church and state, or religion and politics more generally, are often at the forefront of violent political conflicts. An explicit reflection about it goes back, at least, to the gospel itself. And the ones advocating a strict separation between faith and state are probably generally convinced that one of the, if not the most valuable lesson of Western history, paid for with countless human lives, is the separation between politics and religion, or between politics and any kind of deeply held faith, for that matter, except perhaps for deep faith in that separation. Reading William Kavanaugh's The Myth of Religious Violence was for me at least, a watershed event in thinking about the relation between politics and religion. It confirmed and clarified my long-held suspicion about the claims the modern state is implicitly or explicitly making about her own legitimacy. And as Orwell remarked in 1984, the best books are those who confirm and make clear and expand upon what you had been suspecting all along. So before Kavanaugh, I only saw a reflection as in a mirror, but now I know fully. So what do you do when you eagerly want to learn more from someone living across the ocean? Well, you organize a lecture and try to pick that person's brain before and after it. In doing so, I discovered that Professor Kavanaugh not only shared to some extent my uh, anarchist sympathies, but also far surpasses them. For he not only raises questions about the legitimacy of the modern state on a philosophical and theological level, 
He even actively undermines the hegemony of A.B. Inbeth by brewing his own beer. Luckily, he voluntarily paid homage to the superiority of West Fleetren, as that beer greater than which none can be brewed, and which has become incarnate in a definitive and insurpassable manner, manner among the chosen people of Flanders. Among some of his other accomplishments are obtaining a PhD from Duke University, also obtaining degrees from Notre Dame and Cambridge, authoring books like Field Hospital, Migrations of the Holy, Being Consumed and Theopolitical Imagination, many of which have been translated into other languages, several edited volumes, many, many book chapters and scholarly articles, and even more popular articles and countless lectures, of which this will be the next one. He is currently Director of the Center for World Catholicism and Intercultural Theology and Professor of Catholic Studies at DePaul University. Needless to say, we are very happy and grateful to have you with us here tonight at the beginning of what is an extended tour through Europe, and we are happily free riding or free flying on the, on the tour to speak about the wars of religion as a creation myth for the modern state. Professor Kavanaugh, the floor is yours. Thanks, Mikhail, for that lovely introduction, and uh, thanks to all of you for coming out uh, tonight. I've had tremendous hospitality since I've arrived uh, about 24 hours ago, and I want to thank especially the uh, students from the Newman Society, um, uh, Aaron and Jared and Jacob and, and Mikhail and everybody that's uh, made this trip possible, and, and uh, Stefan on Earp for uh, his kind hospitality as well. Um, it's really, this is my second uh, time here in your legendary university, and um, what Mikhail said uh, is exactly right. I um, think about the quote from Benjamin Franklin, uh, beer is evidence that God loves us and wants us to be happy, and so it's really delightful to be here in Leuven where you have both a theology faculty and a faculty of brewing sciences. So, um, so the book of Genesis and the tale of the wars of religion are structurally similar. Both are stories of overcoming primordial chaos that explain the way things are in the present. So what I call the myth of the wars of religion goes like this. Once upon a time, different theological ideas split Christendom into two warring camps, Protestant and Catholic. Only after a century or so of unremitting bloodshed did an exhausted Europe decide that peace depended upon subordinating religious differences to loyalty to the state. From the chaos of the wars of religion emerged the peaceful and secular pro-Westphalian order, post-Westphalian order. This story has proved so useful that it's nearly ubiquitous in Western culture. It was a staple for early modern state-building theorists like Hobbes and Locke and Rousseau, and for anti-religious enlightenment figures like Voltaire and Dobrak. As a term of art, the phrase wars of religion for the wars of this period seems to have originated, as far as I can tell anyway, among French historians of the 19th century at a time when separation of church and state was a live issue. In the 20th century, the story of the wars of religion was also used to promote the marginalization of Christian practices from public life in Western countries. Um, and I think uh, Michael gave an example of that. In the United States, for example, starting in 1940, the Supreme Court told, has told the tale of the wars of religion as evidence that religion has a peculiarly divisive tendency and should therefore be kept out of state-sponsored activities and from the 1970s onward, liberal political theories like John Rawls made the wars of religion a crucial trope in explaining why the public sphere needs to be kept free of religion. Russell Blackford uh, has recently argued that the lesson John Locke took from the wars of religion is, quote, the plausible one that religious organizations are focused on otherworldly doctrines and are ill-adapted for the exercise of secular power. Blackford argues that public policy decisions should be based, therefore, on worldly reasons, and so religious values as essentially otherworldly should not count in public debates over sexual issues, for example, which ought to be based on things like hygiene. 
In Europe today, the myth is equally useful both to left-wing secularists and right-wing nationalists. The wars of religion have taken on an important role in narratives about the danger that Muslims pose to European civilization. The argument, as put forward by Bernard Lewis, Mark Lilla, and so on, is that Islam did not have a 30 years war, and so did not gain the West's wisdom about the need to keep religion and politics separate. By linking this idea to the historical narrative of the wars of religion, Western social orders are made to appear more advanced than Muslim social orders in the evolution of political wisdom. And ironically, on the basis of this narrative, violent interventions of the West in the Muslim world are either downplayed or justified as part of the West's civilizing mission. So the overthrow of a democratic government in Iran in 1953, for example, is ignored as we trace the cause of the Ayatollah's revolution to uh, extremist brews of religion and politics. Uh, the French colonization of Algeria, the Iraq War in 2003, are justified as attempts to spread civilization to black backwards lands. And similar narratives are used to refuse to see the West's own role in fomenting the current refugee crisis and attempt instead to bar Muslims from entering Europe and America. So the wars of religion bear this kind of ideological weight, and it's a weight that's not borne by much more recent and bloodier events in uh, European history. So in recent centenary commemorations of World War I, for example, few use the war as a cautionary tale about the dangers of nationalism. And the hundred million that were killed by, the, by communist regimes in the 20th century are virtually never, as far as I know, held up as examples of atheist violence and warnings about the dangers of unbelief. The reason that the wars of the 16th and 17th century, centuries are remembered so prominently has less to do with the actual events and more to do with their usefulness in public discourse today. So the users of the story rarely bother to discuss historical evidence of any kind. The story has become mythical in the sense that it's simply part of the structures of understanding of Western societies. It's difficult to think outside of the myth because the myth and the reality have become mutually reinforcing. So Western society is structured by the myth and the structures of Western society make the categories under which the myth operates seem natural and inevitable. So the notion that religion is otherworldly, for example, is made more plausible by the exclusion of reasons that are considered religious from public discourse. But they're excluded from public discourse precisely based on the notion that religion is inherently otherworldly, so the logic is circular. It doesn't occur to many people that the categories under which the argument is ca carried on ought to be investigated. So, questions like, if these are wars of religion, what did religion mean then and what does it mean now? If religion is inherently otherworldly, as Locke thought, how did religion become entangled in something as worldly as war, right? Did the combatants maybe not think that religion is inherently otherworldly? And if so, how did Locke conclude that it really is? Uh, is it possible that Locke is not so much stating a fact about the world, but inventing a way of looking at the world, a way that corresponds to certain political arrangements that he favors? So those are the kind of questions that I'm going to be asking. So, and what I'm going to suggest is that the historical evidence shows that the myth of the wars of religion is highly implausible, at least in the way it's usually put forward. Now, I don't at all deny that Christians killed each other, right? Often in drawing on Christian principles to justify the violence. So that's not what I'm, I'm arguing. Clearly, Christians killed Christians, and it was a failure of Christians to live up to the gospel. My argument is rather that it's misleading to call these wars of religion as opposed to wars for secular reasons like politics and economics and so on. Because the religious secular distinction as we now understand it was not born until after the wars were concluded. So my main contribution is to bring historiography of the, the wars of this period into conversations with histories of the idea of religion and the religious secular divide. Historians of the early modern period have as yet mostly been content 
to take modern categories like religion, politics, secular, and so on for granted, and have taken little notice of the histories being done of these terms. And this is especially regrettable because the wars themselves have a crucial role to play in the very creation of these categories. I have time only to give a very brief synopsis of the evidence I present in great detail in my book. This is uh, in chapter three of my book, The Myth of Religious Violence, which has over 300 footnotes, so I swear I did my homework. Um, I uh, talk about the wars of, relig of this period. And so I'm going to summarize that historical evidence. I'm going to add some evidence that um, I've come across since that book was published. And then I want to conclude with some comments uh, and I want to talk about some criticisms that have been made of my argument as well, and then talk about, uh, uh, at the end, what dismantling this myth might mean uh, today. So, here's what the myth uh, looks like if you break it down. For the, the myth of rewards of religion to be true, all of the following components have to be true. First, the combatants opposed each other based on religious difference. In other words, Catholics killed Catholics. Catholics didn't, uh, I'm sorry, Catholics killed Protestants, Protestants killed Catholics, Catholics didn't kill Catholics, Catholics didn't collaborate with Protestants, right? This is a, a, a sort of basic uh, notion. Uh, secondly, the combatants killed each other for religious reasons as opposed to political, economic, social reasons. Thirdly, religious causes then must at least be analytically separable from political, economic, social causes at the time of the wars. And fourth, the rise of the modern state was the solution to the wars. So those are the four components. I'm going to uh, consider each one of these in turn. So the first one, the myth of the rules of religion relies heavily on the idea that religious difference is prone to violence if religion is not removed from the public square. So the Reformation is related to the wars of religion as cause is to effect. First came theological divisions, and then came war. That's the way the story goes. Now, there's problems with this. The first problem is that the Holy Roman Empire spent most of the 1520s, after Luther nailed his theses to the door in Wittenberg, he spent most of that decade at war against the Pope uh, and the Catholic French, not against the Lutherans, right? Charles V's troops sacked Rome, uh, not Wittenberg, in 1527. Furthermore, the Reformation did not create unrelenting hostility. The Peace of Augsburg in 1555, as Peter Wilson points out, ushered in, quote, the longest period of peace in modern German history, not matched until 2008 by the 63 years following the Second World War. The point being that theological differences in and of themselves did not make war inevitable. Now, this point is made more forcefully by the fact that Catholics often fought Catholics and Catholics and Protestants often found themselves on the same side in the so-called wars of religion. So a number, and I give long lists of these in, in the book, I'll just mention a few. A number of Protestant princes fought for Charles V in the Schmalkaldic War, while Catholic Bavaria refused. 1552, the Lutheran princes allied with the Catholic King Henry II of France to make war on the Catholic Emperor, while most of the Catholic princes of the empire refused to come to Charles' aid. In my book, I list 20 examples of Protestant Catholic collaboration during the so-called French Wars of Religion, both among the nobility in resistance to the crown and amongst the peasants in resistance to both the nobility and the monarchy. At the same time, the Catholics were divided between two main parties, the Catholic League on the one hand and the Politiques on the other, who often found themselves on opposite sides of the violence. The Thirty Years' War, lots more examples. Protestant princes, such as the Elector of Saxony, supported the Catholic Emperor early in the war. He even cited Luther as reasons why. Um, the Catholic French supported Protestant princes from early on in 1628, while the Calvinist Dutch were helping the French crown to defeat the Calvinists at La Rochelle, Catholic Spain was supporting the Protestant Duke of Rohan in his battle against the French crown. So it all gets very confused. With Pope Urban VIII's approval, Cardinal Richelieu began subsidizing the Lutheran Swedes in 1631 and began sending troops in 1634 so that the latter half of the Thirty Years' War was largely a battle between Europe's two great Catholic dynasties, the Habsburgs and the Bourbons. 
The Lutheran Swedes, who, by the way, in 1643 attacked Lutheran Denmark, made themselves unwelcome in the empire, provoking most Protestant princes to rejoin their forces to the imperial armies by 1635, and by 1638, the Scottish Presbyterian Robert Bailey said, for the Swedes, I see not what their errand is now in Germany but to shed Protestant blood. All right. Now, I have these long lists, and uh, the historian Harriet Rudolph has responded to me and said, there's no point in making these lists because uh, just the fact that Protestants and Catholics were collaborating or Catholics were killing Catholics doesn't necessarily mean that it wasn't a religious war. Maybe they were uh, allying, making these short-term alliances, even in the long term, they might have wanted, you know, the Catholics might have wanted to kill the Protestants in the long term, but in the short term, they were making short-term alliances. Fair enough, that's a theoretical possibility. Um, but the burden of proof is on her, or it's on whoever wants to make that claim to show that it's more than a theoretical poss possibility that it actually happened, right? And um, the idea that um, you, you're fighting along, alongside Protestants with the idea that eventually you're going to want to turn on them and, and kill them, and that needs evidence, right? And it's not evidence that I've seen so far. So that was a, a partially in response to the book. To that observation, that Catholics killed Catholics, Protestants killed Protestants, they collaborated and so on, we need to add the crucial observation that those doing the actual fighting were largely not zealots, but mercenaries, led by soldiers of fortune who switched allegiances from Protestant to Catholic princes and back. <laughs> Sir James Turner acknowledged that he, quote, had swallowed without chewing in Germany a very dangerous maxim which military men there too much follow, which was that, so that we serve our master honestly, it is no matter which master we serve, right? Now, Harriet uh, Rudolph has responded to me on this as well and said, that's not, you know, that, um, that's not in itself uh, evidence because the use of mercenaries in interconfessional armies at the time was common. And she also says, in fact, it might be evidence that that might have been a reason why political leaders were reluctant to invoke religious reasons for fighting the wars. And my response to this is, um, that sounds like an argument for my side, right? Because what she's done is paint a picture of widespread use of interconfessional armies, widespread use of armies where you've got Protestants and Catholics fighting side by side for a paycheck instead of a cause, and you've got political leaders who are refusing to use religious justifications for the war uh, because of this fact. And I'm thinking, okay, I'll take that actually as evidence for my case, right? Um, so, second of the two components of the myth, combatants killed each other for religious reasons as opposed to political, economic, and social reasons. Clearly, there's lots of instances where Catholics do kill Protestants and vice versa, right? What about those instances? Well, Peter Wilson's exhaustive recent study of the Thirty Years' War that came out after my book uh, came out concludes that, quote, it was not primarily a religious war, end quote. Religion, quote, had to compete with political, social, linguistic, gender, and other distinctions, end quote. So with regard to the rules of religion, then, scholars argue over which factors were more important. 20th century historiography of the French wars, for example, they sometimes drawing on Marx and Durkheim, they tended to dismiss the importance of religious factors up until about the 1970s, when uh, there was an emphasis on religion as the most important factor after Natalie Zeman Davis's work. So I could argue that if Catholics killed Catholics for reasons that are obviously not religious, could it not be the case also that Catholics killed Protestants for, for political and economic reasons as well? The problem with that sort of argument, though, is that in order to make that argument, religion would have to be something separable from political, economic, social causes in these wars. Wilson writes, the war was religious only to the extent that faith guided all early modern public policy and private behavior. 
So trying to separate out religion from politics and other factors in these wars is anachronistic and misleading, and that's the heart of the argument that I make. This is not the case because our forebears mixed religion and politics as if they were two essentially different things that were subsequently joined, but because the categories of religion and politics were being invented in the early modern period and were a result of the wars themselves, there's a growing body of scholarship showing that religion as something essentially distinct from secular phenomena like politics is not in the nature of things, but is a creation of the modern West. And I just uh, reviewed a book, a brand new book called Before Church and State by a guy named Andrew Jones. And it's a, an in-depth study of Louis the Ninth. Um, but what he says in the introduction is really interesting. He's trying to get beyond these categories and he says, Secularization might just as legitimately be understood as the process by which sectors of society and culture were construed as religious institutions and symbols. Right? So secularization is the whole process by which religion is created, in other words. The term religion in the various languages was not simply absent from the discourse surrounding the wars, but when it used, it did not mean what we take it to mean, which is a set of doctrinal convictions essentially separate from non-religious or secular concerns like politics, economics, society, etc. According to Timothy Fitzgerald, quote, in the 16th century, religion is used rarely, and where it is used, it is tightly drawn and specified and embedded in the practices of Christendom, whereas the opposite seems to hold today. Today, religion is used so openly and pro prolifically that it seems obvious that its meaning and ideological function have changed greatly, and that therefore there is a danger of confusion in projecting our meanings back onto earlier eras. The medieval use of religion had little in common with the modern use According to Augustine's City of God, the normal meaning of religio is an attitude of respect in relations between a man and his neighbor. That's nothing like what we mean when we say religion. Right? That would be something we would call secular. The primary use of the religious-secular distinction in the medieval period was to distinguish between two types of clergy. Right? Those who belong to orders and those who belong to a diocese. Right? Catholics still today talk about, you know, uh, entering the religious life, uh, which doesn't mean you suddenly started believing in God, it means that you joined the Jesuits or the Benedictines and so on. Uh, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, the religions of England in 1400 were the Benedictines, the, the Franciscans, the Dominicans, and so on. Religio has a secondary meaning in the medieval period as one of the nine sub-virtues annexed to the cardinal virtue of justice in Aquinas' Summa Theologiae, but religion is not, as religion is in modernity, a universal human impulse, a set of doctrinal propositions, or something that forms a binary with politics or the secular or anything that falls directly outside of the purview of faith. As Aquinas says, quote, every deed, insofar as it is done in God's honor, belongs to religio, end quote. And this includes the acts of justice by which a king governs. Such authority by no means stands outside of the sacred or even of the church. When the term religion is used in the 16th century, it tends to mean something like piety or worship or truth as opposed to heresy. Distinctions of religion and politics or religion secular are absent from the writings of Luther, Calvin, Henry VIII, the other protagonists of the Reformation. With regard to the English case, Fitzgerald notes, religion meant Christian truth. Religion permeated everything. It was usually contrasted not with the secular, which also had a different usage, but with superstition. And when Fitzgerald here says that religion permeated everything, he does not mean that religion and politics or religion and the secular were intertwined and then subsequently separated. Rather, he writes, separation does not describe the historical reality, but only pretends to. Their separation is rhetorical. They are invented categories, not pre-existing generic domains that have always existed. So in the late 15th century, the modern concept of religion as a universal human genus of which religions are species was developing in Platonists such as Cusa and Ficino. In later figures like Grotius, Herbert of Cherbury, and Locke, 
the idea of religion as expressed in doctrinal beliefs and essentially distinct from secular pursuits takes shape. The first modern use of the religion secular binary in English appears in William Penn and Locke after the so-called wars of religion. The religion politics distinction as we know it is even later. This is not just a matter of quibbling over terminology. The important point is that these wars were not fought over something inherently non-political. The Eucharist, for example, was not religious in the modern sense. Debates over the Eucharist in the 16th century were as much about how God wished the community of believers to be ordered as about what was happening on the altar. So Christians did, and this, uh, I think, illustrates that, um, uh, the, the, what we might call the political meaning of the, the Eucharist. Christians did, this is the Ghent altarpiece, Christians did indeed kill each other, often for reasons that appealed to Christian theology. I want to say that clearly again. The point, though, is that there is no way to single out religion from political and social causes when people did not carve up their world in this way. Now, some critics of my argument have mistaken me as saying that people never distinguished between religion and other matters in the early modern period. Philip Benedict has contended against me that people in France argued already in the 16th century about whether or not the wars were religious. According to Benedict, many denied that the wars were religious because by religion was meant true piety. So it was common to deny that one, one's opponents operated from religious motives. But this is clearly not what we mean by religion. Benedict also claims that the modern distinction between religion and politics was operative in 16th century France. But he does show by showing that, quote, the programs of the warring parties regularly mention both kinds of matters, which I think rather again leads credence to my observation that religion and politics were not viewed as two separate kinds of human endeavor. Benedict cites a 1585 comment that the most careful men cannot well judge whether the Catholic League is directed against the state or the new religion, but I think, again, such evidence bolsters my argument rather than undermines it. My point is not that people are unable to distinguish, for example, the Eucharist and taxation. My point is that <clears throat> matters of theological doctrine, such as the Eucharist, could not yet be thought of as indifferent to matters of state such that disagreements over the Eucharist could be consigned to the realm of purely religious squabbles with no business interfering in the public matter of politics. Of course, theological motives and legitimations were present, right? They were Christians. The wars were not, however, religious as opposed to merely mundane wars about political matters, such as the centralization of state power. Locke's solution to the conflicts then that plagued Europe was to separate religion from worldly secular concerns. And when he does this, he doesn't think that he's inventing something new, but rather separating these two things out that have somehow gotten mixed up together. And so he says, the church itself is a thing absolutely separate and distinct from the commonwealth. The boundaries on both sides are fixed and immovable. He jumbles heaven and earth together, the things most remote and opposite who mixes these two societies, which are in their original and business and in everything, perfectly distinct and infinitely different from one another. Talk about protesting too much, right? Locke, of course, was witnessing events that proved that the boundaries were anything but fixed and immovable. Right? The creation of the religion secular and religious politics binaries was the effect of the shifts of power from ecclesiastical to civil authorities in the early modern period, shifts that began well before the Reformation. So you have conflicts between ecclesiastical church authorities and civil authorities as far back as Constantine, and they were frequent precisely because they were being fought over the same turf in some ways, the same framework of a Christian social order, and they were both working to you know, at least in theory, to promote the salvation of Christians. In the late Middle Ages and into the early modern period, however, the balance of power shifts decisively. Ecclesiastical courts were abolished. Lands and revenues passed from ecclesiastical to civil control. Local allegiances and the transnational idea of Christendom were replaced by allegiance 
to nascent national identities. People started to think of themselves as French in this period. As control over appointments to the church's own offices were transferred to civil authorities, as all of these things are happening, the creation of religion comes along as something essentially separate from politics and other secular concerns. And this facilitates the idea that, as Brent Nongri puts it, religion is, quote, a distinct privatized sphere of activity that should support and not disturb the affairs of the newly emerging nation states. So religion becomes a way that you take what the church does and you stick it over there separate from what we, the civil rulers, do. That's a little bit of, of an exaggeration. I'm going to nuance that in a minute, but that's, the, that, that's where it ends up. Locke's treatment of this new arrangement as if it were simply embedded in the nature of things is itself a political move that legitimates the new arrangement. We might wish to argue, of course, that liberal social arrangements are the best ones available. Maybe so. But we should then be aware that we've moved from the descriptive to the normative. Okay, so fourth and final component of the myth, the rise of the modern state was the solution to the wars, right? Protestants and Catholics are killing each other, the modern state steps in and sends them both to their punishment corners, right? Now, again, this does not imply that the wars in question were fought for political as opposed to religious reasons, nor does it exonerate Christians of responsibility for the violence. The wars were fought by Christians and the churches were deeply implicated in supporting the war efforts. Indeed, ecclesiastical authority had in many places been subordinated to or absorbed into civil authority, and this was a crucial part of the problem. What this fact suggests is that the transfer of power from the church to the state in this period was not the way the violence of religion was eventually tamed. It suggests instead that the rise of the state was a cause of and not the solution to the violence. Let me say that again. The rise of the state was a cause of and not the solution to the violence. The idea that the transfer of power from church to state solved the wars of religion is a very common one. So you get Francis Fukuyama, for example, saying, there was a time when religion played an all-powerful role in European politics, Catholics and Protestants organizing themselves into political factions, squandering the wealth of Europe in sectarian wars. Contrary to those who at the time believed that religion was a necessary and permanent feature of the political landscape, liberalism vanquished religion in Europe. And Fukuyama actually has that part in italics. And Rawls and Jeffrey Staub and many others tell the same story. The problem with this tale is that it skips from the wars to liberalism. But liberal government didn't actually appear until a century and a half later, after the end of the Thirty Years' War. And then it appears on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. So the period of Westphalia um, found not liberalism, but what's called absolutism reigning in Europe. Now, some liberal political theorists acknowledge that it was absolutism, not liberalism, that the wars left in their wake. But the common narrative is that absolutism was a necessary step on the way to the modern liberal state. The centralization of political power was necessary to tame the inevitable violence that religious difference introduced after the Reformation. To hold such a view, though, one must ignore the volumes of scholarship that have been produced on the coercive aspects of state building itself. Charles Tilly has this wonderful little comment, war made the state and the state made war. Right? War made the state and the state made war. And, and he shows that in volume after volume of his work. That sums up this view that the apparatus that grew into the modern state in Europe was the unintended result of the elite's need to extract resources from the population for the purpose of making war. Furthermore, the idea that the state absorbed the powers of lesser bodies like the church in order to end the violence ignores overwhelming evidence that the assertion of centralized power over such intermediary bodies was a significant source of the violence in the first place. So Heinz Schilling argues that the invention of sovereignty demanded quote, the integration and concentration of all political, social, economic, and other power under the supremacy of the ruler, and at the same time, the process of state building meant territorial integration and a dissociation from the outside world, which as a rule was implemented in an offensive, not infrequently aggressive manner. 
All the states of the early modern age aimed to augment their state territory through expansion and the annexation of as much territory as possible. Therefore, at the end of the Middle Ages, Europe entered a long phase of intense, violent upheaval both within and between states. So the violence is uh, caused by state building. Michael Howard similarly describes the wars of the period in question in terms of resistance to the centralizing efforts of rulers. And for these kinds of reasons, Jose Casanova, the sociologist, says, the so-called religious wars could also more appropriately be called the wars of early modern European state formation. Now, I don't want to identify state building as the single cause of the wars in question. Obviously, they're complex. My purpose here is the purely negative one of arguing that the idea that the state saved Europe from the violence of religion is highly implausible. The narrative, as it is com commonly told, depends upon the idea that the Protestant Catholic division caused the violence that the state helped to solve. The Reformation and the formation of the sovereign state are treated as two essentially different movements, one religious, the other political, in temporal sequence as if the latter, the, the wars, were a response to the former, the Reformation. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the latter being the formation of the state. But in fact, the two processes, the Reformation and the formation of the state, were deeply intertwined. And the process of state formation preceded, it started before the Reformation, and in some ways it catalyzed the Reformation. In the 15th century and early 16th century, the French and Spanish crowns signed concordats with the papacy, which gave them effective control over the church in their realms. The church became part of the royal clientage system. The Reformation failed there in France and Spain, where the crown had largely already absorbed the church and therefore had no interest in upsetting the status quo. So there's a wonderful quote from Pope Julius III who wrote to King Henry of France, you are more than pope in your kingdoms. I know no reason why you should wish to become schismatic. And he didn't, right? It wasn't worth it. Where the Reformation succeeded, uh, where it, the, the Reformation succeeded, where breaking with the Pope allowed the crown to absorb powers and revenues previously independent of royal control. So Gustav Vasa, for example, welcomed the Reformation to Sweden in 1524 by transferring the receipt of tithes from the church to the crown, and then three years later he appropriated the entire property of the church. Now this isn't necessarily to question the sincerity of Gustav Vasa's theological convictions. He might have been a sincere Lutheran. And theological ideas, of course, played an important role in the Reformation, but the Reformation is misunderstood if it's seen as a religious movement with political effects. The success of the Reformation is as much an effect of state building as it is of the ideas of Martin Luther on the proper interpretation of Paul. So historians now commonly write of confessionalization, the idea that divisions in early modern Europe were a result not merely of disputes over doctrine, but also of state builders' attempts to reinforce their own power through the building of strong confessional identities. So Ronnie Sa writes, conformity required coercion, church and state formed an inextricable matrix of power for enforcing discipline and confessionalism. The history of confessionalization in early modern Germany is in many ways the history of the territorial state. And as Casanova notes, this early modern dual pattern of confessionalization and territorialization was already well established before the religious wars and even before the Protestant Reformation. So in summary, then the rise of the state was not the solution to the wars, but was a significant cause of them. There is no reason to suppose that the rise of allegiance to states and nations produced a more peaceful society. Uh, and, you know, you can just read the history of wars uh, after this period to know that it didn't uh, necessarily work out that way. My further hypothesis is that religion is, in fact, a byproduct of the same state-building process that helped produce the wars. State-building elites would eventually come to see ecclesiastical power as a nuisance. The eventual unprecedented spatial division of religion 
from secular endeavors like politics facilitated the transfer of power from clerical to lay control. Henceforth, as in Locke's scheme, the clergy would be responsible for religion. You go over there and do that. And essentially otherworldly endeavor, which could nevertheless be useful for the promotion of good order within a state. And the civil authorities, on the other hand, would be responsible for all the worldly secular pursuits. And this can be seen as another act in the centuries-long struggle between ecclesiastical and civil authority in Europe and the final victory, maybe, for the civil authority. This was, however, an intra-church affair. This isn't something they did to us. This was all happening within, within the church, really. Uh, the struggle between clerical and lay authority and it was not something done to the church from the outside. The wars marked yet another failure of late medieval and early modern Christians to live up to the gospel. Okay, so now I'm going to conclude. The so-called wars of religion are commonly cited as one of the primary motivators towards secularization in the West. But what came in the wake of the Peace of Westphalia was not secularization as we usually use the term the marginalization of Christianity from public concerns, but rather the subordination of ecclesiastical to civil power. One could argue that in the long run, this subordination of ecclesiastical power led to the marginalization of the church from importance in the everyday lives of people and the eventual atrophying of Christian habits like going to church on Sunday. Right? What confessionalization and laicite have in common though, is the aggrandizement of civil power. What explains the transition from confessionalization to laicite, or what we call secularization, is that eventually states discovered that they could have obedient citizens by allowing religious choice rather than imposing confessional uniformity. But the crucial point is about the, the aggrandizement of civil power. So the so-called wars of religion did not result in a great separation between political and theological concerns, as Mark Lilla would have it. Rather, the theological was absorbed into the modern state when the ecclesiastical power was absorbed into the civil power. Eventually, the state discovered it could do without direct support of the church. But what it could not do without is the theological which mutated from some form of Christian devotion to devotion to the state itself. That's a really crucial point. What it, so the state can do without the church, it can't do without the theological, which mutated from some form of Christian devotion to devotion to the state itself. Hobbes's mortal God or Carl Schmitt's stand-in for the miracle working of the medieval God. Historian Brad Gregory sums up the process in the wake of the early modern wars of state formation this way. Always and only on the terms of the sovereign secular rulers, churches in general would exert only as much po public power and authority as they were permitted. In the confessionalizing 16th and 17th centuries, that was usually quite a bit. In the 19th and 20th centuries, as nationalist and imperialist states not only controlled churches, but also diverted to themselves the prim primary, deepest devotional allegiance and mandatory obedience to their citizens, of their citizens. In what John Bossy called a migration of the holy from church to state, it was usually much less. And in the 21st century, when sovereign states ruled together with the market, it is almost none. So he appeals to this idea a phrase that I picked up from John Bossy as well, the migration of the holy. The holy doesn't go away, it just migrates to the state. So something quite different from disenchantment is going on here. In the 16th and 17th centuries, the emergent state was not drained of the sacred. To the contrary, the absolutist state was often sacralized, right? So already in the 15th century, Charles VIII was given the titles Lamb of God, Savior, head of the mystical body of France, deified bringer of peace. Right? Um, and this then is uh, Louis XIV who took it, <laughs> as if it's possible, took it up a notch from there. Um, 
And perhaps most crucially, the lethal loyalties of the people were beginning to coalesce around the territorial state and eventually around the idea of the nation. The idea of killing and dying pro patria for the fatherland was already taking shape in late 15th century France. Confessionalization helped align Christian identities with citizenship in the emerging sovereign state, rendering the support of the God of Jesus Christ to the state. A further movement, however, would more directly identify the sacred with the nation without the necessary mediation of the church. This um, is the picture that I asked Oxford University Press to put on the cover of my book, uh, The Myth of Religious Violence, and they thought it was a little bit too uh, strong, a little bit too uh, incendiary. But this is the way American school children used to salute the American flag while saying the Pledge of Allegiance, um, and it was changed uh, to hand over the heart after uh, Adolf Hitler made this gesture unpopular in the 1930s. Um, but it's really quite an arresting image, and you can find lots of these images uh, on Google. So there's a whole raft of scholarship on nationalism as a religion and on civil religion that seems uh, important here. Even in the long run, in other words, I'm not convinced that the modern world was disenchanted by the effects of the wars of the 16th and 17th centuries. There was secularization, but in the original sense of the word, when, when it first appears in France in the 16th century, secularization meant a transfer of power or property from ecclesiastical to civil control. And so secularization is transferring something, usually property or power, from the church to the civil uh, authority. And in this case, it was the sacred, right? What we have seen is not the fading of the holy, but the transfer of the holy from the church to the state, a secularization of the holy. Now, the resurgence of nationalism in Europe and the U.S. today, then, is perhaps not so surprising. Le Pen lost, but she got a lot of votes, right? The kind of sacred national identity one finds in France was originally forged in opposition to religion, and the tale of the wars of religion served as a creation myth. Today, Muslims are said to represent the mortal threat of religion, and the myth of the wars of religion continues to serve as a cautionary tale about the wisdom of separating religion and politics that Muslims supposedly lack. Now, there is no doubt that Islamic terrorism is a threat, but the use of the myth of the wars of religion to make Muslims into others to create this sharp opposition between peaceful secular order on the one hand and the inherent volatility of the Muslim tendency to mix religion and politics on the other. I think that's false and it can only increase the tension between the Muslim world and the West and provide more justification for Western military intervention in the Muslim world which has fueled Islamic extremism and the refugee crisis. The myth of the wars of religion, in other words, is itself a justification for violence, and dismantling that myth might increase our chances of living in a peaceful world. Thank you. Now I can imagine there are questions, and I can encourage questions. Uh, Father Aaron has a microphone. First question was so close to that. Thank you. Thank you for the very provocative, uh, challenging lecture. Yeah. Uh, you said that the Reformation uh, is at least also the result of certain political changes rather than merely the result of a theological debate. Would you say that likewise, that this is the case for a Tridentine Catholicism? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, when I talk about confession, I mean, the, the examples that I gave of state building uh, before the Reformation were precisely in Catholic countries, countries that remained Catholic, right? And, the, and in some ways, the reason they remain Catholic is precisely because it doesn't do them any, any they don't gain anything by embracing uh, the Reformation. So in some ways, Catholics invented this, 
right? Although, of course, in the 15th century, there's no distinction between Catholic and Protestant, right? I mean, that's, that uh, then becomes. But, but you're absolutely right. I mean, Tridentine Catholicism then is subject to the same kind of confessionalization that you find in, in Protestant states. The, the, the Kingdom of Bavaria, for example, is a prime example. Um, and it's, it's often talked about in the historical literature about confessionalization. So this was going on in, uh, after the Reformation in both Protestant and, and uh, Catholic realms. And from that, you, you very much get uh, Tridentine uh, Catholicism as this kind of you know, oppositional uh, sort of force. And, and as the kind of force that makes uh, you know, Spain, uh, the Spain of Philip II possible. For example, right, uh, which is then exported to the to the so-called New World, uh, with disastrous effects for the uh, indigenous inhabitants of, of Latin America. Right? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I was excited by your attempt to recover the. The meaning of the term religion. Uh, so my question is, why does it matter uh, that we recover the, the primitive use of the concept religion as we question how it is being used now? Why does it matter? Because it's interesting for me. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. Good question. Um, so I'm not sure that. Um, that I want to, yeah, I mean, I guess in, in a way I do want to recover the, the, the primitive use of it. When, when Augustine uses the term religio, um, and when it's used in ancient Rome, so that's where the, the word religion comes from, obviously. Um, it it comes in the Latin, the, the Latin etymology is it comes from this uh, uh, ligare to bind, right, to sort of, sort of rebind. And it means these kind of binding obligations uh, that one has. And it could be to anything. It could be to a god, uh, but it also could be, as Augustine says, relations of respect between a man and his neighbor, right? Or a woman and her neighbor, right? Um, uh, and so you would say, if you took something seriously, you would say, religio mihi est, right? It's religion to me. Um, and that's a, any kind of serious obligation. If we recover that idea, then, then what it does is it levels the playing field be amongst all of the different kinds of binding obligations that people have, right? I mean, the, the myth of religious violence is that people are much more likely to kill for religion than for secular purposes because religion has a hold on you because you believe in a god that you know creates the universe and so on and this makes you much more likely to use violence in defense of that if you recover the ancient idea then you see that people have all kinds of binding obligations that cause them to kill and i don't think people are more likely to kill for a god than they are to kill for a nation state or for any of the other causes that you can list, oil and land and freedom, democracy, free elections, all of these kind of things um, that we call secular. So it levels the playing field so that we look at the violence of you know, certain uses of the concept of jihad or certain uses of the idea of the sacrificial atonement of Christ we, we look at those at, at, in, in a serious way, but we also look at killing in the name of free markets, free elections, uh, you name it. Um, I wouldn't, though, want to give a kind of once and for all definition of religion precisely because I think it's this term that kind of, so it's not as if I've suddenly discovered what the real meaning of the word is. Um, what's more the case is that it's just this word that changes meaning over time and we just need to be very aware in any given context the way in which it's being used, right? Sometimes it can have benign uses, but sometimes it's not and we just need to be very careful what we mean when we, uh, when, when we use the, the term. Thanks, yeah. Um, just, just a follow up to what you just said, why, why don't we use the word ideology? I think you know you don't. That's kind of the reason in the context that we just described. So why 
would you employ that word? Is that, or would you, would you use it in the context that you just talked about? Yeah, that might be a possible, uh, that, that's one suggestion. Um, there's a French uh, scholar, um, uh, Dubisson, who suggests uh, worldviews would be another way of kind of encompassing all of these different uh, ways of looking at things. And with any term like that, ideology, I mean, ideology has such a negative context, uh, has such a negative connotation, um, especially after Marx and so on, that um, that would be a really difficult term to use because it's usually a term that you use to describe what somebody else believes, right, rather than what, what I believe, you know. Um, and so that, that's a kind I mean, every, every kind of term like that is going to have its, its positive and its negative uh, uses. Um, and so um, I'm not sure, I haven't kind of settled on one once and for all kind of thing. And even the term religion, I mean, I, I, I gave a, um, a talk on the, the larger the book, The Myth of Religious Violence, to the political science department at uh, Berkeley, the University of California, Berkeley, which is a kind of famous um, public state university. And um, one of the students afterwards asked me, um, what do you do with the term religion then? And I said, I try not to use it because it's so ideologically weighted and so on. And so at dinner then, a bunch of the graduate students kind of cornered me and said, look, we've been trying for years to get this very secular university to take religion seriously in the political science department. And here you come along and tell us, you know, don't, don't use it. You're pulling the rug out from under me. I had another guy one time who said, look, I'm in the, you know, this is my job. I teach in the religious studies department at Thomas Jefferson's university, the University of Virginia, a secular university, right? Knock it off. You're going to put me out of a job. Right? <laughs> so, um, so I'm happy to, I, I mean, to recognize that the term gets used in different ways. And some of the ways, you know, if it creates a space for theology to go on undercover at secular universities, and it's like, uh, you know, awesome. That's great. You'll sneak, sneak a foot in the door, right? Um, and so there might be some kind of benign uses, but, um, but we just need to be aware of the way the term is operating, and especially the way it operates in binaries like religion politics, religion se religious secular, um, and, and so. And so your suggestion of ideology as a, as a possible kind of replacement term for this broader category um, uh, might work in, in some contexts, but, but it, it, it tends to have that kind of negative connotation. And still on this recovery of religion as essential in human phenomenon and the possibility of that recovery as creating the level term both for the state and the government of religion in the public space. But I think that recovery of religion as essential in human phenomenon, as it were, creates the impression that there is no problem, that there is no case for actual Christians, for instance, pushing for the introduction of religion in the public space. If religion were to be understood essentially and almost only as a human phenomenon, because where the tension lies is in the inclusion of God, belief, belongingness, and the understanding of religion. So how do you now deal with this? Good, we recover it as essentially a human phenomenon, but at the same time, it actually solves the problem, but opens up another challenge with respect to belief and transcendence, which is often a very critical mark of that time of religion. Right, yeah. I mean, um, I, I want to be careful here because the category of religion is a human creation. But there are phenomena there that I don't think are human crea creations. The, the tendency, the kind of innate human tendency to worship, I think, is something that is a gift from God. As a Christian, I'm going to claim that, right? Um, the problem, as the Bible recognizes, is that people have a tendency to worship all kinds of stuff. And so it goes in all kinds of funny directions instead of towards God that it, it ought to go at. So, so I, you know, I, I assume that there's a real God out there, even though there's lots of idolatries uh, that are out there. So when I say relig religion is a human invention, what I mean is that the category of religion, especially the, the binary of religious secular, that's what's a, a human creation, but not this kind of uh, innate uh, tendency to, uh, to worship.
And so um, that's the that's the, the the nub of the argument. So so when when we enter into these kind of public debates, what I want to have happen is uh, that we we're, we're all operating on the same level of uh, of the conversation. I, what happens oftentimes is that there's this assumption that. I have beliefs, well, usually it's the other way around. I have facts, but you have beliefs, right? Um, and that's the, that's the kind of secularist sort of argument. You know, I, I'm just basing all this on neutral worldly facts, whereas you believe in something that you can't see. And that puts, you know, so as a, as a Christian, that puts me at a disadvantage, right? And so I don't like this idea of believers and non-believers, right? I don't believe in atheists. Right? I think everybody believes in something. And the question is, what do you believe in? So just tell me, well, don't tell me you're a non-believer. Tell me what you believe in. I'll tell you what I believe in, and then we can have a conversation. Right? That's, that's kind of what, uh, what I'm after. Well, my question is very simple. Uh, listening to your last comment, don't you think the problem is not religion? In the human nature, in what you're discussing, because the two is used in different contexts to project yeah. or to subvert interests. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a I think that's a good comment. Um, I mean, what I what I end up saying at the end of the book is that the problem isn't religious violence or secular violence. The problem is violence, right? And so, if we're looking for causes of violence. Um, we need to, to, you know, be doing investigations into human nature. I think that's uh, that's exactly right. And, you know, um, social circumstances and political circumstances and theological circumstances and all of that goes into it. But ultimately, um, again, a kind of leveling of the playing field, right? The problem is violence. Why do people uh, do violence? And, and when we do those kinds of investigations, what I'm asking for is that they be as empirical as possible and as specific as possible. So I really get annoyed by arguments over whether religion is inherently peaceful or whether religion is inherently violent because this category is, is nonsense uh, to me. And the same sort of thing goes with arguments over whether Islam is inherently violent or inherently peaceful, right? Or Christianity, is it inherently violent or inherently peaceful? Well, you have to look at the historical record and say, well, in some instances you've got violence and in some instances you've got peace and people make, make different things out of these kinds of traditions. If you're a Christian, you're going to, you're going to want to say the core of the tradition is nonviolent. And if you're a Muslim, you're going to want to say the core of the tradition is nonviolent, right? Um, and you're going to you're going to want to make those kind of normative claims, and so it's important um, when these questions come up to kind of make those kind of normative claims. But descriptively, we have to acknowledge that you know, look, the Crusaders that was bad, right? Those were Christians. We can't disown them, right? But we can look at the the, the particular circumstances. So let's not have arguments over Islam as stuff. Let's talk about, okay, this particular school of Wahhabism that comes out of the 18th century in, you know, this particular place in Saudi Arabia and has these sorts of effects. Um, as, as much as you can possibly do that, I think then we can have a reasonable conversation. I was at a, um, a conference in Australia uh, recently and there was a, um, uh, a Muslim scholar who gave uh, a talk about offensive and defensive war. And she shows in, it showed in great historical detail that the earliest tradition in the Quran and the Hadith tended to assume that offensive war was not uh, legit, but, um, but only defensive war. Um, but then she showed that as the as, uh, Quranic interpretation becomes Surround, it becomes allied to the court of the emperor, 8th, 9th centuries, um, and, and Quranic interpretation becomes kind of uh, the, you know, monopolized by the emperor, uh, by the caliph, um, then you get arguments 
that uh, offensive war is, can be legitimized and so on. That, to me, was a really helpful kind of uh, historical analysis, and that's the kind of thing that ultimately I'm looking for, is kind of empirical analysis. Sorry, long answer to, to a short question. So just uh, if I could ask a quick question on the idea of migrations of the holy. Donald Trump was, a, was and is a quite a divisive human being. And um, there were very few news stations who were supporting him. And then he sent out 24 Tomahawk missiles into Syria. 59. 59, okay. <laughs> Sorry, 59. Uh, he was very proud. And what happens immediately after that is then the news stations seem to uh, center around him and start to support him, and people are sort of in awe. Uh, and Brian Williams said, this is beautiful, this is beautiful, this is beautiful, I think. He said this is beautiful? 15 or 20 times. Goodness. So the question is, uh, on the, front, the first question is, would you consider this an act of worship or an act of communion, uh, or only sort of uh, up down the Trump or of the state uh, as that holy has migrated towards him. And uh, if that's the case, um, then how do we get the, the holy to migrate back into its proper position or proper place? Yeah, yeah. Um, thanks, Aaron. That's, um, yeah, that's, a, that's an illustration of exactly what I'm talking about here, right? Um, I mean, that's a really dangerous thing because every time uh, an American president goes to war, their popularity surges, right? And so he had a little bump uh, uh, from that, and people started talking about how decisive he was and all this kind of stuff. Um, and that's a really, really dangerous thing because that, that you know, that's the, the best thing you can do. And, and that is an example of this kind of um, uh, sense of uh, we're all in this together and this kind of devotion to the to the nation and the need to kind of have external enemies and all that kind of stuff. So what do you do about it? That's that's your the nub of your question, I take it. Um, the first thing you've got to do is recognize what's going on, right? Um, uh, because the, precisely the way the religious secular uh, distinction operates in this case is to say that's not religious. That's got nothing to do with religion, right? That's that's secular, um, and so we we maintain these divisions in order to protect ourselves from thinking that we're idolaters, right? And this is especially the case for Christians. I mean, Christians can be the worst in, in these kinds of matters, right? But we say no, that's just a political thing. That's not really that has nothing to do with religion, and that way we can worship the God of Jesus Christ and worship this other God at the same time. And that's what the religious secular distinction allows you to do. It allows you to worship multiple gods. Um, and so the first thing we need to do is question that, that very distinction. Thank you very much for your presentation, Pastor General. Um, my question has to do with something you said earlier. You said, um, Obviously, the Crusades, you know, those were bad. And, and you said that just after having finished saying, we need an empirical, very clear, precise, and particular statements about what was going on in these phenomena in order to characterize them correctly. And then you follow that up with a very general statement about yeah, right. a very particular phenomenon. Yeah. You then follow up with an account of the rise of <coughs> Islamic uh, projective violence uh, in, in um, your articulation of the historical study done by um, the, the Islamic scholar you were mentioning his name. Uh, Asba Asrafuddin. Asba Afsafruddin. Sorry. Because, of course, the Crusades were fought primarily against that kind of projected violence. At least some of them might have been. And so I'm wondering if your, your generalized statement um, is in fact valid. Were all of the crusades wrong or bad if we're going to get particular in this very specific context? Um, yeah. Uh, I, I, don't, I, you know, I don't know the history of that period well enough to disaggregate that comment, but I think in general when uh, Christians are killing 
other people that um, it's not a good place to be, right? <laughs> so, um, so let's start there, and you might be able to come up with some mitigating circumstances, and they started it, and we didn't start it, or whatever, um, under certain circumstances. But let's start from the idea that um, the core of the gospel is nonviolence, and um, and then um, we'll see exactly what we have to repent for and exactly how we need to repent for it. But um, I'm probably going to assume that we, we need to do some repenting under those circumstances. You know, other people might need to do repenting too, you know, but I can't speak for the Muslim side. And so, um, you know, that's something they'll, they'll have to work out. But, you know, I, I'm not a historian of that period, so I can't speak about it with any, in, in any level of detail. Um, thank you, Professor. Uh, my question is just uh, a simple one. Um, if we assume that the, the, the world hears the message that uh, this is a myth and religion is not the root of all evil, um, but rather it's human nature or, or whatever, how do we, how do, what, what is your, your vision, so to speak? What, what, what do you foresee happening within the nation state? With, yeah, what, what, what is the next step? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I mean, I, I think what I'm asking for is um, a kind of pluralism that is richer than the pluralism that um, we've often been told is, is the only thing we can have, right? Because we've been sold the idea that people can't have fundamental disagreements in public over really serious matters without violence uh, erupting. We can't really disagree about our faith without killing each other. And I just don't think that's true, right? Um, and I think uh, what I'd like to see is a public space, public spaces, in which Muslims are free to be themselves, Christians are free to be themselves, atheists are free to be themselves, um, people don't have to kind of police the, their language before they enter into conversation with one another. But we meet each other as equals, not as believers versus non-believers, but everybody as a kind of believer in some something, right, or a believer of some sort. And then we'd start talking to one another um, without these kind of exclusionary uh, rules that produce these really uh, dangerous uh, effects, right? Um, that could be one effect. Uh, that's a, so in the domestic sphere, that's what I would be looking for. In the, in the sphere of foreign policy, especially with regard to the United States, I, I would like to see a stop to this kind of scapegoating of, um, of you know, Muslim theology. Uh, as the root of the problem, right? So I mentioned it very briefly, but, you know, the U.S. and Britain overthrew a democratically elected president in Iran in 1953 and installed this brutal secularist regime of the Shah that then proceeded to torture and kill thousands of people over the next 26 years. Um, but we don't know anything about that. All we know is what happened in 1979 when the Shah was overthrown then we say, ooh, what happened in Iran? Oh, those crazy people must have had some wild, you know, religious revival. And that way we cast a kind of fog of amnesia over everything that, that we've done, you know, in there over the, over the past period. So if we do away with this myth, then we can perhaps start asking real questions. You know, George W. Bush, after 9-11, George W. Bush asked the question, why do they hate us? And his answer was, they hate our freedoms. <laughs> right? <You know? laughs> I mean, there's just these, we were just here minding our own business, right, when those crazy people attacked us just because they can't stand the fact that we're over here having a good time, right? You know, I mean, it's just this self-serving nonsense, um, you know. So, uh, uh, so if we get behind that, then we can maybe start unpacking the real reasons that people hate us and maybe, you know, work to, to create peace. Perhaps it's you letting answer uh, this question. And I'm uh, curious about 
or one way if there's a relationship between the war on terror and the meat, the, the, meat, the, the modern meat of the I, I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't catch that. Could Is you? there any connections between the war on terror? The war on terror, oh, okay. And, yeah, and this is the modern meat of religious violence. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, that's what I was kind of referring to at the beginning uh, of the lecture, because there's this, there's this idea out there, and it gets repeated even in academic circles. It's, it's uh, Mark Lilla, it's Bernard Lewis, it's uh, Monica Duffy Toft, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Monica Toft Duffy, um, it's Eric O'Hanson, this idea that, well, mo the Muslim world didn't have wars of religion, and so that they didn't learn to separate religion and politics like we did. And therefore, there's something inherently unstable about the Muslim world. And, and the war on terror then becomes a kind of war to separate religion and politics uh, in this way. And that, I think, becomes uh, dangerous. So that's a kind of direct use of this myth of the wars of religion for the war uh, on terror. And then there's lots of kind of indirect uh, ways that it, it happens as well. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much, Professor Domino. So, um, let me just play a little bit of that. Please. I'm trying to argue for something I'm not sure I myself believe, but <laughs> you know there was this long-standing debate about whether for certain purposes of political morality or religion, or what is called religion, or some phenomena which, to which we usually refer as to religion, should be given a kind of special treatment, distinctive treatment. Uh, and they they used to say that religion is religion is inherently provoking violence, that's why it should. Now you have the counter-argument against this which you just presented. Then they elaborated a little bit the, this argument and said, well, maybe it doesn't provoke necessarily violence, but it's still socially divisive. Now we have the examples of Nelson Mandela, of Martin Luther King, of Wojtyla in Eastern Europe, where religion was strong and growing solidarity. So we have again the counter argument. Then they used to say it's still special because it appeals to a kind of absolute sources of moral knowledge. Now we have again the counter argument because we can reduce whatever Kantianism or utilitarianism to the same absolute claims, and they wouldn't differ from religious claims. Now, does this all mean that religion cannot be treated distinctively for these purposes of political morality? Or maybe it's just uh, that there are too many arguments, and all these arguments together give religion, ascribe to religion a certain special feature, namely that it's all the time defensive. Defensive? Yes, because we all, all the time we have to look for counter-arguments, uh, meaning that all the time they attack specifically us. And doesn't it mean that religion is still special? <laughs> what do you mean by religion? A certain <laughs> set of phenomena to which we in everyday use refer as to religion. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, see, that's the problem, though, isn't it? I mean, religion is whatever people say religion is, and that's and that's what it means. But so, I, so I don't know if this is a counter argument um, that you're making, or you're just kind of making my point in a different way, right? I mean, uh, it, because I mean, you 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 just kind of perpetuated the the myth and then ended up by saying, doesn't this mean that we're, that we're kind of defensive and it's still something uh, special? And it is, but it's only that way because we keep responding as if we know what we're talking about when we talk about religion, right? If we started, if we started just, you know, being baffled and saying, what? What do, you, what do you mean by religion? What is this religion thing that you talk about? Um, rather than just trying to defend it, something that doesn't exist, then we might we might get uh, we might get somewhere. <laughs>
I'm not sure I got the nub of your question, but maybe that's... Thank you. My question is violence, wars, and the migration of the holy towards the state. Do we see still the revelation taking place, the ongoing revelation in all these things? Can we say that the holy is active in disguise in the state today? And what should be the mission of the so-called church or religion towards this state today? Yeah, <clears throat> good question. Um, I'm getting more and more uh, ironic in my old age. And, um, and I'm writing a book on idolatry, um, which is a sequel to this book. And the idea is that um, this is really a book about idolatry, even though I don't mention that word um, in the book because I wanted it to appeal to a secular audience, right? A secularist audience. But it's really a, a book about idolatry that people have a tendency to worship all sorts of things. And the key that I've, that the interpretive key I think I want to use is um, Acts 17, where Paul uh, talks to the Athenians. And what's really crucial about that for me is that Paul is not just hurling anathemas at the Athenians for their idolatry. It says uh, that Paul is distressed by their idolatry. But then he goes on to say, look, we're all groping for the same God, right? And you might grope and, you know, the there's a statue to the unknown God, right? That you might grope and find uh, the real God through this, this kind of process of, of, of worship, right? This kind of natural process of worship. So it, I, I think it's, it's wonderful the way uh, Paul is both uh, critical and sympathetic at the same time, right? And I think you find the same sort of thing in Augustine, that all of these kind of um, spontaneous efforts to worship, they might have bad effects, um, you know, and, and the worship, the explicit worship of God can have bad effects too, right? You know, Nicholas Lash thinks that Catholics are especially prone to idolatry precisely because we see God in material things like the sacraments, right? Um, so there's nothing that gets this gets us off the hook either, right? As a Christian, it, you know, idolatry critique is self-critique first and foremost. Um, but there's also this kind of movement of sympathy that says that we're all worshiping creatures and we're all groping for the true God, um, and we have to do our best uh, to to kind of find that. But that creates a kind of inherent sympathy amongst all the people uh, of the world. I mean, obviously. Um, not everybody is going to accept the claims that a Christian will make or a Muslim will make or, you know, a, a Buddhist will make about what's ultimately out there. Um, but if we can all kind of see each other as kind of participating in um, this sort of search for God, um, then um, I think then, then you can give at least a more sympathetic account of, uh, of what's happening and not simply kind of, you know, shake your fist uh, at others. So again, it's a sort of level, leveling of the playing field um, uh, that I think might be helpful. Professor, we're looking for two more questions. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fine, so, sure. Um, Professor, in your, in your presentation, um, you have talked about uh, Locke and Hobbes uh, as you mentioned them and their typical known as the philosophers uh, and the formation of the modern state. And I just wanted to ask, in your book or as you were researching, did you come across uh, philosophers uh, within a similar time period, 15th, 18th century, um, that do not separate uh, church and state that you included in the text or um, because we typically hear only about Locke and Hobbes, but um, 
Do you have a question? Yeah, interesting. Um, I mean, it's a it's a it's a good question, and the answer is really complicated. I mean, Hobbes, of course, did not separate church and state, right? Hobbes absorbed the church into the state, um, and then Locke has a different kind uh, of arrangement. And so there's all sorts of different kinds of arrangement that you find in uh, early modern uh, thinkers. And a lot of them, of course, I mean, this is a period of absolutism, so a lot of them really don't separate uh, church and state at all. So you've got Robert Filmer kind of giving these theological arguments for the divine right of kings. Um, you've got Baudin, um, it, you know, presenting these kind of arguments for an absolutist state where the, you know, where, where church and state are really kind of mingled. Uh, in this way, and so it's only later then that you get these kinds of arguments for the the separation uh, of the two, and really, in, in some ways, if you follow Locke's trajectory, then 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 you can kind of eventually come to uh, to that point. But of course, Locke was, his, was himself an Anglican who didn't believe in the separation of church and state either. But then, but when you do get the separation of church and state, which really I think for the first time happens in the United States. Um, then you get people kind of drawing uh, on on Locke, but that's a that's a, a century uh, later. Yeah, and and even then, of course, the separation of church and state is not necessarily the separation of uh, religion and politics, at least not in the way that we usually think of that. Yeah. Seems that the last question. So I have a question slash comment, perhaps, and it comes here as precise as a single religion. Um, I would preface the question with, uh, it immediately reminded me of Tocqueville's democracy work by saying, single religion is one of the pillars of like, sustainable democracy in the country. I think the argument goes along the lines of that it encourages uh, people to be more virtuous in terms of like friendship, courage, and all that similar. Uh, who's, who's making this argument? Uh, this is uh, Tocqueville. Oh, okay. Uh, let's, uh, um, so there is a value in civil religion uh, in its relation to democracy. Program. So my question goes: you, you said that there is this migration of hope, and we see that it migrated literally to the modern state, and we can actually see it in this civil religion that there is something wrong with it. Uh, we had Rastafari a couple of weeks, month ago, and one of his claim was that if we take a look at the society today. It's, uh, we could say that even civil religion is being weakened, it's disappearing. There is no longer this, we become isolated the holy and civil, identified with the modern state. And he gave the example of 9 11 memorial when he said, like, what, what we actually witness is more of a civil nihilism than civil religion, because there is no, you know, the signs of, of, of nation, no patriotism, no flowers, no flags. No eagles, nothing. He just observed this civil nihilism of sorts. So, would you say that in the near future, perhaps in the midterm, there is something else taking place of the civil religion? That the, perhaps this is a, to the sequel of your book, of being held. But actually, the, the holy moves somewhere else. It is actually moved from the civil religion. Yeah, this is a really good question, and that's a question that I'm trying to kind of work my way through now. Um, and I and I would have um, before the the recent election of Trump and the um, and the runoff election with Le Pen, I would have said that it was declining uh, in this way too. And now I'm not so sure anymore. You know, I mean, um, it dies hard. And whenever there's violence, it, it, it resurges. Um, and I don't think that you can really do away with it without doing away with social order you know, as a whole in some ways. Um, but I also want to recognize that there is something different. I mean, it's hard these days to get, um, um, and maybe this is what, what Reno was talking about, but it's, it would be hard these days to get people to come out for a Fourth of July parade Wagging, you know, waving flags in in the in a small town in the U.S. Uh, unless there's war going on, right? And and then all bets are off. And so, but but there is a sense. I mean, 
but and this is something that I really have to work out. There's a way in which the market then, I mean, if you were looking for a place where it went, if, if you were to come to the conclusion that civil religion um, has waned, uh, and I'm not sure about that yet, but if you were looking for where the holy went, you might look at the market, right? And, um, and that's a whole nother conversation. Um, but I, I wouldn't uh, be entirely surprised to, to kind of find it there in a very different form in some ways. Because, um, I mean, there's something virtuous. I mean, I really want to write, and this I think goes back to your point too. I mean, I really want to honor, you know, my father who, who served in the U.S. Navy during World War II. And there's a real sense of sacrifice and, um, and something beautiful about patriotism, about the willingness to sacrifice one's life for, for one's fellow citizens that I really think, you know, should be honored in some ways. And there's something that gets lost then if you go to a, just a kind of, if, if the holy migrates just to the market, um, then, then even that, even that, what is what is good in that in that patriotism is lost, and and it becomes a kind of narcissism, and and I think ultimately that's what where consumerism kind of ends up, and it's not so much the worship of products because products keep changing one after another, and you move from one product to the to the next, but ultimately it's a self, it's a kind of self. Worship, and, and that's why I'm kind of looking at Jean Luc Marion's work on idol and icon. The idol is a mirror, it's not really something that you worship, but the idol is a mirror, and you, you basically worship yourself. Um, yeah. I don't know if you have heard the experience of uh, consuming your own book, um, but by this, how do you know you try to solve the brewing beer and making chocolates? Oh, this is chocolate? It's chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's uh, really the book, awesome. The book of my chocolate, so. <laughs> I'm glad you told me that. I might not have eaten it otherwise. Well, I'll talk about consumers and brewing it. Thank you. Thanks for coming. So we, we recorded this lecture, so if you want to uh, listen to it again, it will be available on YouTube uh, soon. And we have a sign-up sheet for the newsletter if you want to find out about our events next academic year uh, over there here with Jacob. Um, so thanks again, and see you uh, next academic year. Thank you. Well, this is great. This is really yeah, wonderful. I, I remember, Joe, your, your comment about uh, wanting to talk to the different cohorts.